One day in February, there appeared on Mr. Williams's desk in the Art Museum of a certain university a catalogue from J.W. Britnell, a London dealer. And accompanying it was a typewritten communication, which ran as follows. Dear sir, we beg to call your attention to number 978 in our accompanying catalogue, which we shall be glad to send on approval, yours faithfully, J.W. Britnell. To turn to number 978 in the accompanying catalogue was the work of a moment, and in the place indicated, Mr. Williams found the following entry. 978, unknown. Interesting mezzotint, view of a manor house, early part of the century, black frame, two guineas. It was not especially exciting, and the price seemed high. However, as Mr. Britnell, who knew his business and his customers, seemed to set store by it, Mr. Williams wrote a postcard for the article to be sent on approval. A parcel of any kind always arrives a day later than you expect it, and that of Mr. Britnell proved no exception to the rule. It was delivered at the museum by the afternoon post of Saturday, after Mr. Williams had left his work. And it was accordingly brought round to his rooms in college by the attendant. Here he found it when he came in to tea with a friend, Professor Binks. It was a rather indifferent mezzotint, and an indifferent mezzotint is perhaps the worst form of engraving known. It presented a full-face view of a not-so-very-large manor house of the last century, with three rows of plain sashed windows with rusticated masonry about them, a parapet with balls or vases at the angles, and a small portico in the centre. On either side were trees, and in front a considerable expanse of lawn. The legend AWF sculpts it was engraved on the narrow margin and there was no further inscription. The whole thing gave the impression that it was the work of an amateur. What in the world Mr. Britnell could mean by affixing the price of two guineas to such an object was more than Mr. Williams could imagine. He turned it over with a good deal of contempt. Upon the back was a paper label, the left hand half of which had been torn off. All that remained were the ends of two lines of writing. The first had the letters N-G-L-E-Y Hall, the second, S-S-E-X. What is this place? said Binks. Just what I'm going to try and find out, said Williams, going to the shelf for a gazetteer. Look at the back. Somethingly Hall, either in Sussex or Essex. But I can't imagine how Britnell thinks he can charge two guineas for it. There aren't even any figures to give it life. I don't think it's so badly done, replied Binks. The light is rather cleverly given, and I would have thought there were figures, or at least a figure, just on the edge in front. And indeed there was. Hardly more than a black blot in one corner of the engraving. The head of a man or woman, a good deal muffled up, the back turned to the spectator and looking towards the house. Williams had not noticed it before. Still, he said, I can't spend two guineas of museum money on a picture of a place I don't know. Further attempts by Williams to locate the subject of his picture in the gazetteer proved unsuccessful, and in due course he went down to Hall for dinner. Later in the evening he returned with a few of his colleagues, and I have little doubt that whist was played and tobacco smoked. During a lull in these operations, Williams picked up the mezzotint from the table without looking at it and handed it to a person mildly interested in art, telling him where it had come from and the other particulars which we already know. The gentleman took it carelessly, looked at it, then said in a tone of some interest, It's really a very good piece of work, Williams, and the figure, though it's rather too grotesque, is somehow very impressive. Yes, isn't it? said Williams, who was just then busy giving whiskey and soda to others of the company and was unable to come across the room to look at the view again. But some time past midnight, after the visitors had departed, and as he was lighting his bedroom candle, the picture once again caught his eye. And what he saw made him very nearly drop the candle on the floor. In the middle of the lawn, in front of the unknown house, there was a figure, where no figure had been at five o'clock that afternoon. It was crawling on all fours towards the house, and it was muffled in a strange black garment with a white cross on the back. I do not know what is the ideal course to pursue in a situation of this kind. I can only tell you what Mr. Williams did. He took the picture, locked it up in a drawer, and retired to bed. But first, he wrote out and signed an account of the extraordinary change which the picture had undergone since it had come into his possession. The following morning, he invited his neighbor, Nisbet, to breakfast. 
During the meal, nothing was said about the mezzotint by William, save that he had a picture on which he wished for Nisbet's opinion. But afterwards, when the morning pipe was at last lighted, he unlocked the drawer and, without looking at the picture, put it into Nisbet's hands. Now, he said, I want you to tell me exactly what you see in that picture. Describe it, if you don't mind, rather minutely. I'll tell you why afterwards. Well, said Nisbet, I have here a view of a country house, English, I presume, by moonlight. Moonlight? Are you sure of that? Certainly. The moon appears to be on the wane, if you wish for details, and there are clouds in the sky. All right. Go on. Though I'll swear there was no moon when I saw it first. Well, there's not much more to be said, continued Nisbet. The house has three rows of windows, five in each row, except at the bottom where there's a porch instead of the middle one. But what about figures, said Williams? There aren't any. What? No figure on the grass in front? Not a thing. You'll swear to that? Certainly I will. Oh, well, there's just one other thing. One of the windows on the ground floor left of the door is open. Is it really? cried Williams in great excitement. My goodness. He must have got in. It was quite true. There was no figure, and there was the open window. Williams, after a moment of speechless surprise, went to the writing table and scribbled for a short time. Then he brought two papers to Nisbet and asked him first to sign one, his own description of the picture, which you've just heard, and then to read the other, which was Williams's statement written the night before. Yes, said Nisbet. I expect you're right. He's got in. It looks very much as if we were assisting at the working out of a tragedy somewhere. The question is, has it happened already, or is it going to come off? We must find out what the place is and get this thing photographed before it goes further. While Nisbet dealt with the photograph, Williams went in search of Mr. Green, who had been college bursar for many years. The college had property in Sussex and Essex, and Green had travelled widely in both counties. However, he was not to be found for the moment. His business had taken him to Brighton, and he was not expected to return until the following day. What do you mean to do now? asked Nisbet. Are you going to sit down and watch the picture all day? Well, no, I think not, said Williams. I rather imagine we are meant to see the whole thing. And besides, I have a kind of idea that it wouldn't change much, if at all, in the daytime. We might go out for a walk this afternoon and come into tea or whenever it gets dark. I shall leave it out on the table here. My skip can get in, but no one else. It was five o'clock when they returned to Williams's rooms. The first thing they saw was the picture leaning up against a pile of books on the table, as it had been left. And the next thing was Williams's skip seated on a chair opposite, gazing at it with undisguised horror. He was a servant of considerable standing, and nothing could be more alien to his practice to be seen sitting on his master's chair or appearing to take any particular notice of his master's furniture or pictures. Begin your pardon, sir, he said, but it ain't the sort of picture I should hang where my little girl could see it. If she were to catch a sight of this skeleton here, or whatever it is, carrying off the poor baby, she would be in a taking. It don't seem a right picture to be laying about, sir, not where anyone that's liable to be startled should come on it. With these words, the excellent man went to continue the round of his masters, and you may be sure the gentleman whom he left lost no time in re-examining the engraving. There was the house, as before under the waning moon and the drifting clouds. The window that had been open was shut and the figure was once more on the lawn. But not this time crawling cautiously on hands and knees. Now it was erect and stepping swiftly with long strides to the front of the picture. The moon was behind it and the black drapery hung down over its face so that only hints of it could be seen. And what was visible made the spectators profoundly thankful that they could see no more than a white dome-like forehead and a few straggling hairs. The head was bent down and the arms were tightly clasped over an object which could be dimly seen and identified as a child. Whether dead or living, it was impossible to say. The legs of the appearance alone could be plainly discerned. And they were horribly thin. 
From five to seven, the companions sat and watched the picture by turns, but it never changed. They agreed at last that it would be safe to leave it while they dined in the hall. When they returned, the figure was gone, and the house was quiet under the moonbeams. There was nothing for it but to spend the evening over gazetteers and guidebooks. Williams was the lucky one at last, and perhaps he deserved it. At 11.30 p.m., he read from Murray's Guide to Essex the following lines. Sixteen and a half miles, Anningley. The church has been an interesting building of the Norman date, but it was extensively classicized in the last century. It contains the tombs of the family of Francis, whose mansion, Anningley Hall, a solid Queen Anne house, stands immediately beyond the churchyard in a park of about 80 acres. The family is now extinct. The last heir having disappeared mysteriously in infancy in the year 1802. The father, Mr. Arthur Francis, was known locally as a talented amateur engraver in Mezzotit. After his son's disappearance, he lived in complete retirement at the hall and was found dead in his studio on the third anniversary of the disaster, having just completed an engraving of the house, impressions of which are of considerable rarity. The next day, Mr. Green the Bursar returned from Brighton and was at once able to identify the house as Anningley Hall. Is there any kind of explanation of the figures, was the question which Williams naturally asked. I don't know, I'm sure. What used to be said in the place when I first knew it was that old Francis was always very much down on poachers, and by degree he got rid of them all but one. Gordy was his name, and he was the last surviving member of a very old family. I believe they were lords of the manor at one time. What, like the man in Tess of the D'Urbervilles, Williams put in? Yes, I dare say. It's not a book I could ever read myself, but this fellow could show a row of tombs in the church there that belonged to his ancestors, and all that went to sour him a bit. Anyway, he always kept just on the right side of the law, until one night the keepers found him at it in a wood right at the end of the estate. Well, you can imagine there was a row, and this man Gordy was unlucky enough, poor chap, to shoot a keeper. Well, that was just what Francis wanted, and poor Gordy was strung up in double-quick time. I've been shown the place he was buried in, on the north side of the church. You know the way in that part of the world. Anyone that's been hanged or made away with themselves, they bury them that side. As I said, he was the last of his line. And it was always rumoured that some friend of his must have planned to get hold of Francis's boy and put an end to his line, too. I should say now that it looks more as if old Gordy had managed the job himself. I've only to add that the picture is now in the Ashleyan Museum, and that though carefully watched, it's never been known to change again.